Welcome back to Radio Signals. My name is Mark, and my call sign is N9WIB. This is the Technician License Series, lecture number 10. And today we will be discussing feed lines and standing wave ratio. The topics that we'll cover in this presentation include an introduction to feed lines, the types of feed lines most commonly used in amateur radio, We'll also introduce the concept of the standing wave ratio, or SWR, and review various type of feed line connectors. And finally, we will complete the presentation with a introduction to antenna tuners and antenna analyzers. Feed lines are essentially the cable that connect your radio to your antenna. The cable also can connect equipment such as antenna tuners or analyzers to your radio as well. Feed lines are composed of two conductors that are separated by insulating material such as plastic, foam, or other materials. The radio frequency signal is carried on the surface of the conductors and also the space between them. Feed lines are built to minimize power dissipation and that power dissipation is known as loss and loss occurs as heat. So the energy is dissipated as heat if it is not transferred from the radio to the antenna. Feed lines also minimize leakage of radio frequency energy by mechanisms such as shielding. Feed line losses increase when frequency increases. So this means that you're, if you're operating at the HF bands and let's say 160 or 80 meters, the feed line losses are gonna be relatively small. However, the feed line losses are going to be much more significant if you start operating on the VHF and UHF frequencies, such as uh, the 400 megahertz region or the 2 meter region. And more losses essentially means your signal's not getting out. So the more loss, the more loss in signal. All feed lines have impedance, and that characteristic impedance is known and denoted by a capital Z. Impedance, as we recall from previous lectures, combines reactance and resistance. It is essentially the opposition to flow of radio frequency energy. It measures how energy is carried by a feed line and it is measured in ohms. Factors that infect, affect impedance include dimensions of the feed line and conductors. So the longer the feed line, the more impedance there's going to be. And the fatter the feed line, or the more thick the feed line is, the less impedance there's going to be. Spacing between conductors also affects the impedance of your feed line, as also, and also the insulating material used will affect impedance. This slide shows various types of feed line. The most common type of feed line used in amateur radio is coaxial cable. And there are various types of coaxial cable, from skinnier types to fatter types, from more flexible types to more rigid types. The coaxial cable is uh, composed of an outer jacket, typically vinyl, and then just inside of that vinyl jacket is a braided shield conductor. This can be copper or aluminum. And then if we go a little bit deeper into the feed line, there's something called a dielectric. And that dielectric is essentially insulation that protects the center conductor from the braided shield, braided shielding on the, on the outside, on the inner portion of the uh, vinyl jacket. And then finally at the center, you have the center conductor. So as we learned in the first few slides, coaxial cable has two conductors, one being the center conductor and in the case of coax, the second conductor is the braided shielding just below the vinyl jacket. And that vinyl jacket does also act as uh, some degree of shielding or protection from the elements. Now, the cable below the coaxial cable is called heliax. This is still coaxial cable, but this really cannot be bent in it or it can't be bent very much. It is a rigid type of coaxial cable. 
and Heliax has the least amount of losses. You can see that the center conductor is composed of a tube, and as we learned in previous slides, the RF energy is carried on the surface of the conductor, so there's really no need for a center or solid material for the uh, center conductor. It can be a small tube because the RF energy is carried on the outside of that conductor. And then we also have the shielding just outside of the, I'm sorry, the dielectric insulation just outside of the center conductor, and then a more rigid um, ribbed type of uh, copper material or aluminum material that really doesn't bend much as the um, shielded conductor. So that's coax. And to the right of the pictures of the coax, we have open wire line. Open wire line can be known as twin lead line or 300 ohm line or window line, which is probably the most common type of open feed line that amateur radios operators use. And this has a 450 ohm impedance. And you can see that there are two conductors. And these conductors are separated by air and also plastic. And you can see these small little openings in the tracks of the open wire um, conduit and that's why they call it window line. Ladder line is something similar to this, but the spacing between the wires is much greater and it's generally more open. So there are varying degrees of open wire. Um, going back to coax, coax has a typical resistance of around 50 ohms or impedance uh, more accurately of 50 ohms, but the window line has an impedance of 450 ohms. So we will learn in later lectures that we have to do some degree of matching uh, to uh, make the RF signal go through the cable and out the antenna if there's differences in impedance. Coaxial cable is again the most common type of feed line. It carries a radio signal on the surface of the center conductor and inside the surface of the shielded conductor. The shielding can be placed, the shielding is a benefit in that the coaxial cable can be placed near other conductors with little effect on the signal. So it can be placed near uh, uh, other conductors such as a metal pole or something else without too much of an effect on the RF energy within the actual cable. And again, there are flexible and rigid types. The rigid types are known as heliax, and certain types may actually be directly buried, or you can pass the cable through a conduit and bury it underground if it is not uh, rated for direct burial, but you can direct burial coaxial cable, but it has to be rated for that. Now, this is something that's gonna be important in your amateur radio career when you're setting up antennas. The uh, coax type and losses per 100 feet. So when you buy coax uh, or some other type of feed line, you want to know how much loss there is per 100 feet. And that's kind of a standard definition. So the probably the thickest and least loss uh, cable that we have depicted in this uh, table is LMR 400. And the losses are uh, marked in decibels. So we've got two frequencies, the losses here in decibels at 30 megahertz, and we're gonna compare that to the losses at a higher frequency of 150 megahertz. And we'll also, we've also calculated the percent power reaching the antenna at 100 feet for both frequencies. So let's look at LMR 400. So this is generally the thicker type of coax and more robust type of coax. It is still flexible, but not as uh, small and flexible as uh, other types of cable we see lower down on the table. So LMR 400 at 30 megahertz has a decibel loss of 0 0.7. So 100 feet run of LMR 400 will only result in a 0 0.7 dB uh, RF loss. And the percent power reaching the antenna will be around 85%. So 85% of your RF energy will reach the antenna, not accounting for other issues like SWR uh, and other losses. But the losses at 150 megahertz is 1.5 dB. 
So for 30 megahertz, it was 0.7. For 150, 150 megahertz, it's 1.5. As we learned before, the losses in the coaxial cable go up with frequency. And only 71% of your power will actually reach the antenna with LMR400. Now let's go down to RG213. So uh, the losses per 100 feet is 1.1, 78% of the power reaching the antenna. And the losses for at 150 megahertz is 2.5. And the power actually reaching the antenna is only 56%. So you almost have only half of your power reaching your antenna for the RG213. And you can see the losses go down from there. So that's, it's a worsening loss with smaller types of cable. Larger diameter cables will have less loss. And you also want to uh, protect your outer jacket from damage. You want to try to protect your coax as much as possible. UV light will result in degradation and cuts in the outer jacket may also allow water into the outer conductor sheath leading to cable failure. So you want to make sure that your cable is rated for outdoor exposure and uh, you want to make sure that there are no cuts or nicks in the outer jacket that may allow water into the cable. And if the water gets into the cable and gets into the shielding, it may actually penetrate through the dielectric and get to the center conductor, shorting things out. So you also want to inspect the cable. Um, if your cable's been up for a year, you want to probably make it a point to do a yearly inspection of your feed lines and make sure things are, are still kind of up to snuff. You can bend coax, but don't bend it extremely sharply. If you do this, the inner conductor may experience some stress and may kind of penetrate the dielectric over time and come in contact with the shielded conductor. And then you have a short circuit within your coaxial feed line. Open field line, as we mentioned before, is uh, two parallel wires separated by an insulating material ladder line, window line, or twin lead line. The most common in amateur radial use is the window line. It has much less loss than coaxial cable, and it is not shielded like coaxial cable, but this stuff can be a little more finicky and difficult to use. It's a great, it's, it's something that is great to use as feed line, but uh, it's not as forgiving as coax. It cannot be directly buried or placed near conductors or metal conduit since it is not shielded. It should not be bent. It can be bent a little bit, but it shouldn't be bent at sharp angles. Uh, otherwise, it could potentially break. And as we had seen in previous slides, it has uh, different impedance than coax. Coax is a general impedance of around 50 ohms, and open feed line can have a variable amount of impedance ranging from 300 ohms to 400 ohms to uh, 600 ohms. Ideally, power carried by a feed line is fully transferred to a load or the antenna. Impedance in a feed line and antenna have to be equal for this ideal power transfer to occur. If impedance is not equal, then some power is reflected back into the feed line and the transmitter. Reflected power and forward power in a mismatched feed line create standing waves. Some waves that are out of phase cancel each other out, while others that are in phase increase in amplitude. As we learned before in previous lectures, the waves that are in phase will increase the amplitude and create a larger wave, and those that are out of phase may cancel or reduce the amplitude of those waves that are created. The maximum to minimum amplitude of the standing wave is called the standing wave ratio. Standing wave ratio is commonly thought of a ratio of forward power to reflected power. However, that's not really the case. It's actually the amplitude of the standing waves there that are created in the feed line. More reflected power increasing standing waves and increases in efficiency. So this is a 
diagram and animation by Lucas Vieta that I found on Wikipedia. And this depicts standing waves perfectly. As we can see that there is a forward wave, the blue wave, that can be considered the RF power coming out of your transmitter. And then the red wave is the re reflected RF from the antenna mismatch. So as those waves go back and forth, they create a final wave in black known as the standing wave. So the standing wave isn't mo moving forward or back. It's standing in one position. It's fixed in one position. And the amplitude of that wave derives or creates the standing wave ratio. SWR is the same along the entire feed line, but is commonly measured at the transmitter's connection to the feed line. When there is no impedance mismatch or no reflected power, the SWR is known to be one-to-one, -one, resulting in a perfect match. SWR can change with frequency. As SWR increases, more power is reflected and lost as heat. So a high SWR ratio is not something that's desired. A low SWR means more of your signal is getting out on the air. So you want as low an SWR as possible. Generally between two to one or, or 1 1.5 to one is an acceptable SWR. A high SWR also increases voltage at the feed point and at the transmitter junction. So that means there's a high voltage point at the transmitter. Increased voltage may actually damage the transmitter circuitry if the SWR is too high. In many modern radios, the radio is able to sense this increase in voltage and thus it its circuitry reduces the power output of the transmitter. So that's a protective mechanism. So it's great for protecting your radio, but that means if there's a high SWR and high voltage at the transmitter uh, feed point junction, then your radio is going to reduce its power and not put as much power out. So your signal is essentially diminished. Causes of high SWR include a non-resident antenna, and a non-resident antenna could be due to a length discrepancy. Either the antenna is too long or too short for the desired frequency. It can also be due to a damaged feed line or a damaged connector. Loose fitting connectors usually result in an erratic SWR reading. Coaxial connectors are something that each ham will have to become familiar with. You need a connector to actually connect the coaxial cable to your antenna or your radio. These connectors can be soldered on or crimped. The HF and VHF connectors are typically, most commonly, the PL259 and the SO234 are the most common for the HF and the VHF frequencies. Above 400 megahertz, there's a specialized type of conductor connector called the N-type connector. And remember, if you have the coaxial connectors within your hab shack, that's fine. But if you actually have these connectors outside, there you need to protect them from the weather. Otherwise, water will get inside of them and potentially into your coaxial cable, causing a short circuit. So these need to be protected. And typically, you can buy a specialized tape to go around the connectors and protect the connectors from moisture. This slide depicts various type of connectors used in ham radio. On the top left portion of the slide, you can see the most common for the coaxial cable, the SO239 and the PL259. And a good way to remember this is just by how they're depicted. So SO stands for socket, so socket 239, and this is the female component of that type of connector. The PL259 is the plug or the male connector. So that's another easy way to remember PL259 for male, plug for male, and socket for female. Other types of connectors for the uh, UHF region above 400 megahertz are the N type of connector depicted on the bottom of the slide here, both male and female types. Other types of connectors are the BNC at the top right and the SME connector on the bottom right. And these you'll find commonly associated with your handy talk, your HT antennas or smaller coaxial cables.
SWR and watt meters. An SWR meter is placed in line between the radio and antenna, and it's a device that measures the standing wave ratio. Watt meters are also placed in line between the radio and antenna and measure the forward and reverse power. Remember, the watt meter does not directly measure SWR because it's measuring the forward and reverse power, but if you use an equation or a chart, uh, the forward and reverse power can be converted into the SWR. And some meters actually contain both an SWR meter and a watt meter. And these are various types of SWR and watt meters. The one on the left is a combination SWR and watt meter. There are also devices called antenna tuners. So what happens if you have a high SWR in your system, in your line, your coaxial feed line from your transmitter to your antenna? There's something you can do to actually uh, fix the SWR, but it's important to remember that these antenna tuners are hooked up between the radio and the tuner and from the tuner to the antenna. So these antenna tuners per se are adjusting the standing wave ratio only between the tuner itself and the radio, not between the tuner and the antenna. So impedance matching devices are placed between the radio and the antenna. So the tuners are impedance matching devices. It's composed of a variable capacitor and inductor to change and match the impedance to an SWR ideally below 1.5 to 1. So as we remember, the uh, impedance is a combination of good old plain old resistance plus reactance. And reactance, there's in two components of reactance, there's the capacitive reactance and the inductive reactance. And the in a resonant circuit, the capacitive reactance and inductive reactants cancel each other out, and you're only left with ohmic resistance, and that is a resonant circuit. So it goes to say that if you utilize capacitors and inductors in a antenna tuner or impedance matching device, that will uh, allow you to reach resonance between the radio and the antenna tuner. The device essentially matches the impedance between the radio and the antenna, again, not between the tuner and the antenna. There are manual tuners and automatic tuners that uh, can be purchased. This allows the radio to provide full power to the tuner. The mismatch, again, still exists between the tuner and the antenna, thus the losses still occur. So there's full power going to the antenna tuner, and there's no high voltage created at the radio, and so therefore your radio won't uh, start reducing power on its own, so the radio is allowed to uh, apply full power up to the point of the impedance matching device or the antenna tuner and present that to the antenna, but the SWR may still be mismatched or will be mismatched between the antenna tuner and the actual antenna if that is not a resonant antenna. There are also devices called antenna analyzers, and these measure the impedance and SWR across a frequency range for a specific antenna. Graphical models exist, and it does not need to be connected to the radio. And these are, are great devices. You can just uh, hook up to your antenna and see uh, what the SWR is across a range of frequencies. So you can do this even before you hook it up to the radio and then uh, proceed by either lengthening or shortening your antenna and getting a better SWR before you actually utilize this with your radio. And this is a uh, photograph of a rig expert antenna tuner. That's a graphing model. So you can see that there's a resonant frequency right in the center and the SWR is kind of higher on the edges. So this is such an important concept. I thought we'd end with just reinforcing uh, the antenna tuner and SWR and impedance matching. So this is a depiction of your radio and antenna tuner and your antenna. And you can see the feed line is in dark blue and light blue between the radio and then the tuner and from the tuner to your antenna. And let's say this system has a high SWR of, uh, let's go four to one. 
So the SWR is, is high at four to one. So therefore there is an impedance mismatch. There is, um, a lot of reflected power going back and forth between the radio and the tuner and the tuner and the antenna. So when that happens, the reflected power is going back and is causing an increased voltage at your radio. And your radio is not going to like this. So it's, let's say we're putting out 100 watts and there is the impedance mismatch and high SWR um, and the waves are kind of bouncing back and forth between the antenna, the tuner, and the radio. The tuner is not tuned right at, at this point. So the radio is going to sense this and say, I'm trying to put out 100 watts, but you know what? I'm getting a lot of voltage buildup. I'm going to start decreasing my power. I'm going to start decreasing to 50 watts. And it's still happening. I'm going to start decreasing to maybe 25 watts of power. So instead of getting 100 watts of power out into the antenna, your radio is sensing that high SWR and just turning the power down itself. So your signal is really not getting out. And that's the point where you're going to turn to your antenna tuner or impedance matching device. So you're going to, if it's an, if it's an automatic tuner, it's going to do it on its own. If it's a manual tuner, you're going to adjust the knobs and then those knobs are going to consist of a variable capacitors and a variable inductor to match the impedance. So once that impedance is matched and you have a better SWR, all that power is going to go from your radio to the tuner and the radio is going to be happy and say, hey, I can actually put out more. There's a, there's a decreased voltage. I can actually put out maybe close to 100 watts. So we're going to go back up to 100 watts now that we have a SWR of, let's say, less than 1.5 to 1. So your tuner has adjusted or matched the impedance between the radio and the tuner. And that SWR is effective between the radio and the tuner only. And that's allowing your radio to put out the full power you specified to the tuner. But it does nothing for this. It does nothing for the tuner the co uh, feed line between the tuner and the actual antenna, the SWR of four to one still exists between the tuner and, and the antenna. All it's doing is allowing your radio to put out maximal power and matching the mismatch between the radio and the tuner. So in high SWR still exists between the tuner and the, and the antenna. What can you do to lessen the SWR and increase the chance that your signal is actually going to get out with maximal power? You can potentially move the tuner as close as possible to the antenna. That would be one option. And then the impedance mismatch between the antenna and the feed line would be minimal. But a better way of doing it is to actually make sure your antenna is resident and make sure you have a, an impedance matching device between your feed line and the antenna that results in a low SWR. And that's something we're going to get into in later lectures. So the, the bottom line is that the antenna tuner only matches as much as possible the SWR between your radio and tuner and uh, improves the impedance mismatch between the radio and the tuner, not between the tuner and the antenna. The problems still exist between the tuner and the antenna. There are other things you can do to change that and improve that, which we'll get on to later in later lectures. So the antenna tuner is kind of a, a misnomer. It's not really tuning your antenna. It's tuning the uh, junction between your radio and the tuner itself. That wraps up another lecture. Thanks to everybody for joining us again. We reviewed feed lines, standing wave ratio, connectors, impedance mismatches, and how to improve your impedance mismatching. So we hope that everybody learned a lot today.
Join us next time on a future lecture, and don't forget to show your support by going to radiosignals.org. And don't forget to like us on the YouTube channel, and click the like button and subscribe. See you next time.